Hi everyone, welcome back to Miss Roni Reads. Today I'm going to be reading for you a short story called Laminex and Mirrors from Kate Kennedy's Like a House on Fire. I hope you enjoy it. Laminex and Mirrors. Laminex and Mirrors, that's me. Or at least that's meant to be me. That's my own particular jurisdiction, I discover when I arrive at dawn on my first day at the hospital and am solemnly handed gloves, a cloth and a spray bottle. The other cleaners have got their pace down to an art and it is the pace of the patients themselves, shuffling along the hospital corridors with their drips and tangled tubing, the slow, measured preambulation of those with an endless, unvarying stretch in front of them. The cleaners spin out their morning's tasks, glazed and unhurried. I don't get this at first. Not quite 18 and fresh out of school, I'm saving money to go to London and I'm eager beavering my way through my lot of duties on this holiday job, intent on making a good impression. Marie, the head cleaner, is annoyed with me when I finish early on that first day and seek her out, conscientiously for another job. I surprise her in the linen cupboard, feet up on a chair, and the daily paper open to the births and deaths. I finished, I announce as she looks up, startled and sprung. Have you now? She smiles thinly, a cup of tea and two biscuits balanced on her palm. Well, uh, Dot's on bedding today and Nolene's doing floors, so you can, um, clean out the ash bins. At the grand entrance to the hospital stand two tall black bins for cigarette butts and other detritus abandoned by hurrying visitors, things smoked and gulped and discarded as nervous relatives pace outside. Inside each can is a toxic soup of ash butts and coffee and polystyrene. I tip each bin into the industrial skip, groping for the high-pressure hose, the smell of them making me turn away and wretch until tears come to my eyes. The smell will stay hanging on me all day, burned and stale. Marie's revenge on me, I realise belatedly, for working too briskly. We break at 7am to sit in the kitchen and drink tea from thick cups while the catering staff stands at the huge industrial benches stirring gigantic terrines of custard and tomato soup. Dot tries to sell us mail-order cosmetics and cleaning products. She's nervy and keen to please, cheerfully volunteering for the unpleasant jobs. I've never met anyone like Dot, whose hair is black combed into an actual beehive and who blinks hard with watery-eyed nervousness when anyone addresses her directly. While we're restocking the paper towels in the toilets, though, she tells me the best value toilet paper to buy, the one that's rolled more tightly than the others, so you get more. It's criminal, in Dot's opinion, that those toilet roll companies are allowed to get away with it. Well, thanks for the tip, I say as she heads off along the corridors with a wheelie bucket and mop, ready to attack the expanse of cafeteria floor. Lysol is still stinging my nostrils from the empty dash bins, now sitting pristine back at the entrance, and I have already made a lifetime vow this morning to never smoke. One of the pa the patients calls me back when I've finished cleaning his room. An old bloke, ex-army. You look like a lovely girl, he rasps, grabbing for my wrist. There's a few dollars in my bedside table there. How would you like to do an old man a favour and go down to the kiosk and buy me a packet of smokes? He names the brand, his gaze upon me steady and desperately hopeful. Under no circumstances, the matron has already told me, her lips stiff with disapproval, am I to comply with this request. The man's dying, his lungs already clagged with tar. It's unbelievable. He tries it on with everyone. I smile apologetically at him. Sorry, Mr Morton. Matron's got to you, has she? Sorry, but yes. Don't know what's going to kill me first, he mutters. I give his breakfast tray an ineffectual rub. He hasn't touched his poached egg. I can't blame him. It's sitting there like an uh, the eye of a giant squid. Mr Morton has an oxygen mask, but he tells me he hates using it. Feel like the thing's choking me, he says, like in the war. Constrained in his bed, he lies with his fingers constantly rubbing each other, missing the smokes. Mr Morton's never asleep, even at 5.30am when I clock on. How are you today? I say to him each morning as I spray and wipe his perfectly clean mirror. No good, he whispers, his frail pigeon chest sucking the air in. You don't feel like just bringing me one ziggy, do you? And wheeling me out there onto the veranda?
He jerks his head towards the courtyard visible from his double glazed window, a rotary sponsored rose garden manicured to within an inch of its life. I'm sorry, Mr. Morton. Matron would kill me. Yeah, I know the feeling. I linger for a few minutes and we chat, his wheezing laugh threatening always to turn into a coughing fit. I know you're a friendly girl, says one of the nurses in a low, embarrassed tone when she stops me in the corridor a few minutes later, but it's best not to fraternise too much with the patients, if you're a cleaner, I mean. Right, I say, sorry, just do your work. Sorry, I will. I trudge, my face burning down towards the corridor of elective surgeries. It's okay, I tell myself. At the end of the summer holidays, I will have saved enough for three months in Europe, where I will walk the streets of Paris and London, absorbing culture and life and fraternising with whoever I like. Down in electives, bed after bed is filled with miserable girls with two black eyes and post-rhinoplasty noses swathed in bandages. My parents gave me this one from me 21st, one honks dolefully as I spray her mirror. If I had known it was going to hurt like this, I wouldn't have had it done. Just look at my eyes. She gazes over my shoulder into the mirror with the fretful, restless scrutiny that has caused all this fault finding in the first place. You can't tell if she's pretty or not because of the swelling and bruising and the black rim of blood around each nostril. She sighs and climbs back into bed with her magazine. The room smells of nail polish and expensive bunches of flowers. Soon the hospital, I'm told, is going private, and every wing will be like this one, with glistening white ensuite bathrooms and upmarket floral bedspreads in every room. Down in the oldest public wing, there is an ancient bathroom, slated for demolition, with three huge enamel baths inside. Rust-coloured marks streak the surface under the chrome taps where millions of leaks have dripped year after year after year and whenever I glance in and see them I think of sick patients in the old days lying awake in their beds listening to that nocturnal dripping like a relentless echoing clock marking their time left. Each idle post-op girl surrounded by hothouse flowers watches me with the same bored incurious gaze as I move about their rooms spraying and wiping. I pump mist over the immaculate mirrors, catching sight of my own reflection there, my unreconstructed nose and studiously neutral face. Like these girls, I'm filling in my own allotment of time here, except that when I leave, it'll be to buy that plane ticket to London and be gone. My hand holding the yellow cloth rises and falls, cleaning pointlessly, searching for a splash of toothpaste or cup ring mark on the laminate's spotless, glossy surface. You know what I found? Dot says as she passes me in the corridor, pointing to my blue spray bottle. Don't even use those commercial cleaners. Metho and newspaper, that's the best thing for cleaning windows and mirrors. But Dot, I say, don't you sell all those cleaning products? I do, she concedes, but it's the cosmetics I believe in. That morning at tea break, she slides a catalogue and an order form in front of me as if it's already a done deal. And have a look at the jewellery, she whispers, tapping the catalogue eagerly. So reasonable. Marie puts down her teacup and gives me a shrewd look. Do you think you're ready for more responsibility? She asks. I look up from the page of friendship rings. Well, I guess so, yes. Can you operate a floor polisher? I've seen the ones she means, the massive hydraulic polishers in the storeroom. What about Nolene? Her back's giving her trouble. Okay, I'll give it a go. Dot's looking at me hard, blinking. If you could just fill in what you want before you go, I can get the order off in time for the Christmas discount, she says. I'm caught in the high beam of her earnest gratitude, the undiluted optimism of her pale blue eyes. Dot's husband, Len, can't take her home, business seriously, she's told me. He doesn't think that she's got what it takes to sell enough jewellery and makeup to be eligible for the Christmas bonus. I've met Len. He often joins us at morning tea on his way home from the night shift at the printing works, and his coiffed ducktail matches his wife's beehive in a way that makes me wonder where they met and in what year. The corridor down to surgery, Marie says. She hands me a bundle of steel wool. For all the wheel marks, she adds. The hand controls of the hydraulic polisher jada and jar out of my grasp as the spinning discs hit the floor and grab. It takes off like a bronco. Use your hips, girl, says Noreen, as I let it go in a panic and we lean against the wall weak with laughter.
she's right. When I nudge the polar shore along with my hips and keep my arms held tight at my sides, I can get the thing under control. I waltz the linoleum corridors in big sweeping arcs, walking backwards, making everything shine, singing top 40 songs to myself. There's a good clean smell of metho where dots polish the glass doors and the deafening whine of the machine like the white noise erasing the tedium. Then I get down on my hands and knees and scrub with the steel wool at the black rubber streaks left by the wheels of the circuitrical trolleys. Sometimes, even as I'm scrubbing, a new trolley bangs through the doors and I crawl out of the way to give it room to lay a new purposeful trail of black streaks for me. Six more weeks, I think to myself as I go, and I'll be cashed up and out of here. I look up from the floor and smile briefly at the nice South African male nurse who takes the patients into surgery on the early shift. His uniform's blue and mine's an ugly mauve, clearly distinguishing our status in the hospital pecking order, but he still asks me to the staff Christmas party. The other cleaners, when they hear this, behave as if it's a doctor-nurse romance from Mills and Boone. They speculate what table we'll sit on, what they'll wear, whether they'll be on door prizes this year. When, I'm, if, when I say I'm not sure if I'll go, they look at me flabbergasted. But it's free, Dot says, and there's a whole three-course meal. That nice young man asked you to go, I reckon you go, says Dolene. He's from overseas somewhere, isn't he? Play your cards, right? You might get a trip OS. I'm already going overseas, I want to say to them. I'm saving up and I might never come back. But they're all smiling so brightly, so encouragingly, that I nod and tell them I'll be there. And I say yes to Tony, the nurse, because of the way he holds the hands of the sore and sorry nose job girls and tells them, look at you, you're going to look gorgeous. He turns them to blink, hopefully, at their woebegone, bruised reflections in the mirrors, smiling warmly over their shoulders at the transformed vision they long to see. Honestly, he says, in a week or two, you won't know yourself. And I watch them smile back, tremendously optimistic again, under this small kindness. Mr Morton asks me every morning about the cigarettes. Please, doll, he says, I'm gasping for one. I look at him, sitting sleeplessly in bed in his stiff new pyjamas, racked with coughing that threatens to squeeze the life out of him. He tells me the specialist has been to see him and given him the bad news, as he calls it. Weeks or possibly a month or two, he says. You know what these fellas are like? I told him. They used to give us smokes in the army. They were regulation issue back then. I don't know what to say. Seems pretty ironic, doesn't it? These things happen, he says. He surveys his empty hands bleakly. I marched last Anzac Day, he adds. Hard to believe, isn't it? He looks morosely out through the sealed window to the courtyard garden where the five iceberg rose bushes struggle to survive their pruning. His fingers move restlessly against the bedsheets and each other. Anyhow, me daughter's coming down to see me bring in the grandkids. Oh, that's great. When are they arriving? Not sure. Tuesday, maybe? After this round of tests, anyway. Mr Morton, I'd smuggle you a cigarette. Really, I would if I could, but I'm only here as a casual and they'd sack me in a minute. Saving up for something, are you? To go overseas. Yeah, I didn't think you were the kind of girl looking for a lifetime career cleaning tables. Not that there's anything wrong with cleaning. It's all work, isn't it? Yeah, it is. He coughs again and I hear the rattling undercurrent in it, like an old engine that won't turn over, a battery that's nearly flat. Oh, I'd kill for a smoke though, he says when he can speak again. Seriously, it's not as if they can hurt me now. I'm remembering my directive about fraternising, but I hate standing here beside his bed like some official. I sit down and peel off my glove, pick up his hand, it's like a bundle of twigs. That hand, I tell myself, held a rifle, tried to stop itself trembling with terror, worked all its life. Are you right for everything else? I say. Yeah, I am. I am right. Don't mind me. The fingers squeeze mine. Suddenly, Marie's at the door. Can I see you, please? She says, her tone like permafrost. I stand up quickly. Sure, I say breezily, smiling at Mr Morton as I leave. Marie's furious. The matron's seen me lingering in here and has sought her out and spoken to her. 
You clearly haven't got enough to do if you've got time to sit around annoying the patients. Here, she thrusts a canister of cleaning powder at me, a scrubbing brush. You can go down and clean the old bathroom out from top to toe. The what? The bathroom in the Menzies wing. I stare at her stupidly. But it's about to be demolished. Next week, she snaps. She has her chin up, outraged at my inexcusable lapse, my insolence. Now get down there and do it and stay out of Matron's way. But she came and found me, she says in an enraged whisper. What, slacking off in the storeroom, I want to say, but instead meekly take the Ajax and brush from her and traipse down to the old bathroom. I have to step over builder's scaffolding and drop sheets to get in there, and someone's already disconnected the sinks and levered some broken tiles off the wall with a crowbar. It's ridiculous. I'm cleaning equipment that will be in the skip next week. Still, I take a deep breath and turn on the old tap to rinse out the first bath, which is so deep I have to climb into it to really scrub it clean. I'll look back on this and laugh, I think grimly, as I scour away at the rust stains. I don't own these pe- owe these people anything. I can just finish in January and walk away with my $3,000 and my passport and get out of here. There's a big high pressure shower hose on the wall and when I'm finished I will swing it over the ceramic surfaces of the bath till they're gleaming ready for the wreckers to tear out and dump. Then this wing will be rebuilt into shining private rooms fitted out the mold with the molded seamless shower recesses. Dot mops every day, all laminex and mirrors, all reflective surfaces everywhere. After this, I think idly, I'll go down to the function hall and polish the parquetry floor that there until it's so buffed and shining that Marie will be called to account if someone takes a tumble on it at the staff Christmas party. Perhaps someone could sue her. I'm getting close now, Dot tells me, waving the order form gaily at morning tea after Noreen. Noreen's bought two bath oil and moisturiser pamper packs from her catalogue. It's a week till Christmas and I've been up a ladder dustily dustily hanging festive green and red bunting along the corridors and suspending plastic holly decorations in the doorways with sticky tape. A dab of eucalyptus oil on cotton wool, Dot advised in passing. We'll get that off later. Have you asked the scholar if she's seen anything she likes? Nolene says to her jokingly now, fishing in her handbag for her purse. That's their nickname for me now, the scholar. Ever since Dot saw me at the bus stop after work one day last week reading a novel. I thought she'd finished school, she said, and I'd answered, yeah, I have. And she stood looking at my book with a perplexed air. Oh, she'd said abruptly. Right, almost flinching with shy goodwill. Now I watch her carefully counting change for Nolene out of her purse, and until this moment I felt annoyed at this nickname and the thought of them discussing me, impatient to be in a world instead where reading a novel in public isn't a cause for comment. But I suddenly change my mind. It's the purse that does it. It's so worn and well used compared to the elegantly grey wallet I got for my 18th. That and the care with which the two of them handle those coins. I pull the catalogue towards me and tick boxes on the order form, adding up as I go. I reach the total which entitles Dot to the Christmas gift bonus. I keep ticking until she's eligible for the coveted gold seller 24 carat stick pin. That's two shifts worth of salary. I pull from my grey wallet as she holds out an envelope, speechless. Ten hours of spraying and wiping, crawling on hands and knees, scrubbing at rubber streaks, upending ash bins and gagging, mopping chlorine in shower recesses, mindlessly buffing laminex. That's a lot to pay for some tacky jewellery and April Violet's body lotion. And we both know it as I hand over the money. I wait around to see the look on Len's face when she tells him. His expression, I think to myself, will be worth it. Here's another mistake I make. I think Len will be chastened, satisfyingly disconcerted, forced to eat his words. When he hears, though, he is radiant with pride. As he congratulates his wife, it strikes me for the first time that with their odd shifts, this 15-minute tea break is the one of the few times the two of them will see each other all day. All things going well, those earrings will be here in time for you to wear to the staff Christmas party, Dot assures me. Terrific, I say. She and Len glance at each other again and grin, and I've got my money's worth after all. 
I walk, work backwards today from elective surgery ward down to the nurse's station and the recreation room because I don't want to run into the matron unless I have to. There you are, says Mr. Morton when I get to his room. Well, at least somebody's happy to see me. Get a telling off, did ya? Just for talking to an old man. I shrug like it means nothing, like I'm a nonchalant girl on her way to Europe in real life. Don't worry about it. I hate the way I'm keeping my voice low and furtive as I tidy up his newspaper and spray the table. Heard any news about your daughter coming with the kids? Yeah, tomorrow they reckon. He sighs, taking a quavering breath. What's wrong? That's good, isn't it? Well, he says, hesitating like it's my feelings that should be spared. He glances up at me and I'm struck by the sharp blueness of his eyes. It is and it isn't. It'll be because they've given her the word. I wait, thick-headed and confused. She's interstate, he says softly. She wouldn't come unless I was on me last legs. I look at him, then his bony, carved, thin shoulders rise and fall. I'm not complaining, he says, his eyes on the empty garden outside. That's just the way it goes. It's easy to start work half an hour early the next day. The night staff gave me a tired, vague smile as I head into the staff room to change into my uniform and I can just see the rim of the sun rising on the horizon like a burnished disc as I slip into Mr Morton's room. What's this? he says, blinking at his watch in the gloom when he sees me. It's only just gone five. First cab off the rank today, I say, and nudge the door shut with my foot. Man with important family visitors, do you reckon you can get into your wheelchair? He looks at me. Of course I can. I feel the sinewy old muscle in his arm as he lowers himself and the remnant strength as he leans over, hauling his breath in to put on his own slippers. Then he sits back up and I stow his towel and toilet bag and we're ready. Nobody stops us as we wheel down to the deserted Menzies wing. Nobody even notices us. Mr Morton whistles when I steer him around the scaffolding and through the door. Now that, he says, is what I call a bath. I just smile as I turn on the taps and let the water thunder into the tub. Back in his room by six, I'm thinking, and no one the wiser. And it's so clean, he says, shaking his head. I know, I say I cleaned it. You little champion. There's an awkward silence as we both look at the steam curling off the deep, waiting water. I can wait outside if you'd rather and leave you to it with the stepladder there, I say, or I can give you a hand in. Up to you. Don't want to embarrass you. Let me give you a hand then. There's nothing to it in the end, just a steadying grip to help lift him up and over the rim. In the water, he cautiously releases his hold on the sides and lets himself float outstretched, eyes closed against the rising steam. I stand there holding his pyjamas and dressing gown, terrified he'll have a coughing fit or that someone will burst in. Do you know, he says, I haven't had a bath in I don't know how long. Used to have him having to sit on a plastic chair in the shower or stand there clutching those bloody grab rails. Haven't been like this for years. Like what? I say. My heart is jumping in the back of my throat. Weightless, he says finally. Completely weightless. I keep my face neutral and preoccupied as I hurry him back along the corridors to his room. He's pink-faced and loose-limbered in his fresh pyjamas and comb-ploughed damp hair. The doctor never puts his head in till at least 8am at least, he says. What is it now? It's 6.25, I answer. I see a nurse passing at the end of the corridor and look down. Shouldn't have worn my mauve uniform. Should have worn my own shirt and pretended to be a relative. But nobody stops us. It's still too early. In his room, I hold the mirror while he runs his electric razor over his cheeks and chin, putting a hand to his chest to put the, pull the slack skin on his neck taut, observing his own reflection critically as he finishes. You know, I never wanted to live past 75, he says, till the day I turned 74. As I put his shaver in his toilet bag, I see an unopened bottle of aftershave with a sticker saying, Happy Christmas, Grandad, still on the box. I raise my eyebrows inquiringly. Why not, he says when he sees me holding it up. Pass it over here. It's the recklessness in his voice that decides me. 
I help him change his pyjama top for the shirt and sweater he has hanging in his cupboard and I hold out my hand to help him into the wheelchair again. He looks at me shrewdly. Where are we going? Looking great in his shirt and jumper like anyone's grandfather, like someone who'll be checking out of this hospital any day now. AWOL, I say. It's true too. I know as I wheel him out the door that we're crossing the point of no return, way beyond any casual fraternising I could explain away. But nobody sees us as we pass three rooms on the way to the exit door leading to the courtyard. And anyway, I can't let him down now. Not when he's shaved and changed and keeps clenching and unclenching his hands with anticipation. It's awkward manoeuvring the two of us around to depress the lever on the door and open it, and there's a sucking sound as the airlock is broken when I lean into it. A draft of fresh air blows over us, and I worry that the cool air outside will bring on a coughing fit, but Mr Morton takes a deep, careful breath with his face up to the weak sunlight, fumbling for the brake on the wheelchair as we reach the tanbark square of garden, then settles his hands in his blanketed lap with a sigh. He watches me with gleaming, expectant relish as I tap out a cigarette from the packet in my bag and pass it to him, then dig again in my bag for the lighter. When I bring its flame to the tip of the smoke in his mouth, his hand grabs mine and holds it. Then I feel the grip relax as he tilts his chin and exhales like he's been holding his breath for a long, long time. He lowers the hand with the cigarette to his knee with a calm, slow relief. What can I say, he whispers through a wreath of smoke. Your blood's bot worth bottling. I smile and check my watch, my own hands shaking. It's almost seven. Just don't inhale too deeply and start coughing, I say. No chance of that, he mutters, bringing the cigarette back to his lips as if he's blowing a, ling blowing a lingering kiss. He's like a different man with a cigarette in his hand. He gazes affectionately at the rose bushes and beyond them, off to the distant hills visible between the hospital's east and south wings. You look very nice, I say. Do I? I feel bloody great, he says, stretching with a contented yawn, and there's a little zephyr of morning breeze that washes over us, warm and fragrant with the faint scent of blossom. And I'm about to speak again when the propped up propped open door slides slowly shut behind us on its hinges. There is a terrible echoing click as it closes on its own deadlock and I recognise the sound as soon as I hear it. It's the sound of a plane door closing without me, ready to taxi down a runway and take off to London. Suddenly, I very much doubt I'll be going to the staff Christmas party either. Was that the door? Mr Morton says, his eyes fixed on the hills. I'm afraid so, so we'll need to find another entrance. His carefully combed, side-parted hair and the prickles of white whiskers he's missed on his face send a piercing, protective ache through me. Yeah, but don't worry, it'll be fine. You can take your time now. Don't you worry, he says, I am. He gives the butt one last regretful glance and throws it onto the path where I stub it out with my toe. Ready when you are, he says. I wheel the chair to the far corner of the courtyard and down past the pathology wing, around the corner, skirting rows of garbage skips and the and up the path beside accident and emergency. There's no chance of slipping through unnoticed now. The hospitals come awake and nurses and doctors are walking in briskly from the staff car park, eyeing us curiously as I make my way past a locked door and yet another emergency exit, also locked. We'll have to go in via the front, I say to Mr Morton. There's no way round it. Don't worry, he says. I've been to the front and survived once already. I'm laughing as he adds, I'm real sorry though. You'll lose your job, won't you? I couldn't care less about the job. What about you going off to London and all? I'll just go a bit later than I planned. It's not like it's going anywhere. Sorry to make you run the gauntlet though. Nothing to apologise for, I say. I'm around the corner now, wheeling the chair on the long, sweeping stretch of pavement leading to the black glass doors of the impressive entrance or atrium. The two black ash bins stand sentinel at either side, but someone else will be hosing them out this morning. Here we go, I whisper, bending to Mr Morton's ear. The woody, clean fragrance of his Christmas aftershave makes me want to cry. Eyes front, he whispers in return. 
we start up the wide concourse with its landscaped box hedge border, morning light hitting the tinted glass of the doors and heads turning to us as we approach. Mr Morton's shoulders go back and his chin lifts and we're clipping along now. Left, right, left. There's no way I'm doing going to do him the disservice of skulking in. It's up and over the top for us. Down in the kitchen, the other cleaners will be pouring their cups of tea out of the urn now, Marie remarking coolly on my absence, and Matron will be waiting for us, I am certain, at the nurse's station in the no man's land of the hospital's thermostatically cool interior, its sterilised world of hard surfaces wiped clean and blameless. Someone else's jurisdiction now. Mr Morton feels it. I know he does, because I hear him start humming, it's all a long way to temporary, which dissolves in a hoot of laughter, then a coughing fit, and I reach down and grab his frail hand again till it's over. Then we push on, both of us smothering laughter, and this moment is the one I remember most clearly from the year I turned 18. The two of us content, just for this perfect moment, to believe we can go on humming, and that this path before us will stretch on forever. That is the end of Laminex and Mirrors. I hope you enjoyed listening to this short story by Kate Kennedy. We have her book in our school library and it is full of other stories just as wonderful as this one. I hope you will borrow it and read it. Please let me know if you do. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next time.